So um, welcome to Hope Church, everybody. My name is David. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a pastor here at this church uh, today. And um, during this time, I'm actually going to invite up Johnny and Anna uh, to come with us uh, to the front. And so uh, we've never done a formal introduction of Johnny and Anna within our congregation. And, um, and you know, one of the things that we really um, we wanted to do is um, let you guys know that Johnny and Anna, so basically Johnny will be serving or has been serving as our college and, um, uh, our college and youth pastor uh, over the last couple of months. And one of the things that like um, we, we kind of like always uh, kind of like smile and joke around about was like there were a lot of things that happened leading up to actually bring Johnny to this place, right? So it's by no mistake actually that Johnny and Anna are here uh, with us today. And uh, it's probably why I'm in such a good mood these days. So if you see me like more like active and smiley than normal, it's because I'm, I'm just really happy that they're here with us. Uh, I feel so much um, just comfort and, and just um, knowing that God is really in full control of this ministry to bring people like them to our ministry. So, so um, but, but with that said, I, I do want to actually offer up a time where we, we can pray for Johnny and Anna because um, they're, they've really committed to investing into our community, into loving our community. And one of the jo things Johnny always tells me is like, I just want to love people, you know, I just want to spread the gospel, you know, and that's, that's an amazing heart that he has. But, you know, again, there, there's struggles with that at times. And so um, if we could just all together as a congregation pray a pray prayer of blessing Prayer, prayer of safety, prayer, prayer of um, anointing upon uh, Johnny and Anna um, as, they, as they help uh, lead our ministries and, and bless our congregation. So, so again, as I mentioned before in, in the past, when God sends Abraham out, he says, you are, I've blessed you in order, for be, uh, in order for you to be a blessing to others. I think it's, it's, it's good right now during this time as a congregation that we can bless them so that they may be a blessing to others. So if we can all just reach out our hands and let's, let's pray for Johnny and Anna. And um, we'll pray for about a minute or two, and then, um, and then I'll, I'll close this out in prayer. Heavenly Father, Jesus, Lord, I just thank you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I've, Lord Heavenly Father, thank you. Just uh, the, the God and that, Lord, as they embark on this journey of ministry and doing this amazing things, Lord, they're with impacting people's lives, impacting people's hearts, Lord. I thank you for everything that you've brought into their lives up to this point. We always talk about those things, and we always kind of joke and laugh, Lord God, but it's really, truly by no mistake that they are here, that they are your precious children, and they are here to serve you and love you, Lord God. I just love them, Lord, and it's, it's an amazing blessing to have them with us, Lord God. You are truly great. You are truly sovereign. You are truly amazing through all of this, Lord. We put our trust into you, Lord God, and you have full control of your lives, Lord God. I love you. Thank you that they've taken the call and step forward and step out. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for Johnny and Anna for, for being obedient to your calling in their life, Lord. And, and I pray as, we've, as I've introduced them to our family and as they be, become a part of our family and as we've, we get to journey with them, we get to, to walk alongside them, do ministry with them, you know, impact people's lives with them, you know, do everything that you've called us to do as a church alongside with them. I pray that we can be supportive, loving. I, I pray for Johnny and Anna, Lord, that you'll give them the strength continuously to just do your works. And at times, Lord, even when it gets hard or at times when even when it, you, we may not have all the answers, Lord God, may you guide them. May you keep a, a, a warm presence of comfort over them, knowing that you have their backs no matter what. We thank you, Lord. We thank you and we celebrate Johnny and Anna to you. And we love you and we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's give a clap off to the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you, church. Um, can we just give it up for my wife one more time? Um, oh. They say uh, there's a, behind every great man, there's a greater woman or something like that. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's in the Bible. And um, <laughs> I wouldn't be where I am as a, as a pastor. Um, if it wasn't for her. So, um, so if my sermon is terrible, it's because it's her, of her. And if it's good, um, and if my sermon is great, it's because of her. So, um, yeah. 
Um, I'm just so grateful to be part of this church for the past couple of months. Uh, you guys have the best pastors and David and Beth and just the care that they have for this church. And so I'm just grateful. Um, so happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the room and also all the spiritual fathers. Spiritual fathers are just as important. Um, and as joyous and celebratory day Father's, day Father's Day can be, I also want to acknowledge that for some of us, Father's Day can be more painful than joyful. I also want to acknowledge that it could, be, uh, it could bring out more bitter feelings than lo loving feelings. Maybe for some of us, uh, we've been trying to become fathers and we're struggling to conceive and have never conceived. Maybe for some of us, our father has passed away and we miss them today. And maybe for some of us, our father is currently sick. And maybe for some of us, our father wasn't really a father in our lives and left. And maybe for some of us, we never really received the intimacy and the love that we desired um, as children. And maybe for you, you are a father in this room and you feel like you have failed or you are failing. If that is you today, I want to say as a church that we acknowledge your pain. And as a church, I think we can all agree that we experience pain. Uh, maybe this week, in addition to or other than Father's Day, you had a really rough week. Uh, maybe you had a really rough, rough week at work, or a rough week in your marriage, or in your household, or you watch Avengers Endgame, <laughs> Iron Man. <laughs> or uh, it was Kevin Durant getting injured. Um, the pain that is real to all of us is what I wanna talk about today. Uh, and just like a good dentist or a good doctor, I promise to tread lightly. Uh, I don't have any lollipops, but uh, my mom has Korean food after service, so. Uh, yeah, Korean food. Um, so let's dive into scripture. Uh, our scripture today comes from John 20, chapter 24 to 27. Um, and that's the title of my message, Sharing Our Pain. To give some context of this passage and where we are in history, Jesus has died on the cross and he has recently resurrected. Uh, he has appeared to his disciples in the passage before, but Thomas was not with them and he was one of the disciples. And that's where this passage picks up. A lot of people refer to this uh, passage as Doubting Thomas. So let's dive in. Now Thomas, oh, uh, now Thomas, one of the 12, called a twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but belief. Let us pray. God, I just, I just want to thank you. I thank you that you are good and that you are God. I pray for every heart in this room. I pray for every heavy heart. And I just pray that you would meet us in such a powerful way that we would know that you are with us. Lord, uh, may I decrease and may you increase. And the Holy Spirit, may you have your way. And God, let's just have some fun today. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to ask three questions today. And the first one is, can we share our pain? Uh, if you don't know, I currently work in retail as a sales manager. And one of the things I love to do is I love to talk to my coworkers about Jesus. I love hearing their stories, and I love uh, somehow sharing how God could be real in their lives. 
It excites me. And when, they get, when I get a reaction, I get even more excited. Uh, and so a couple months ago, a coworker came up to me and asked me, hey, Johnny, why do you believe in God? And I, and I did what any smart Christian would do. I quoted Tim Keller. <laughs> and if you don't know who Tim Keller is, he's a pastor, a theologian, and an author. And so I said, I spent my whole life trying to be seen, known, and loved. And I've done everything I could to do so. I've partied, I chased girls, I've done some crazy things, and I still felt lost. And as I said this, she starts crying. And I go, whoa. I need to call Tim Keller all the time. <laughs> and I said, and, and we keep on talking, and what she says to me is that she stopped talking to God after her best friend died. And what I said to her is, God wants to hear your heart. God wants to hear if you're upset, disappointed, if you're in pain. I believe many of us can relate to my coworker today. For some reason or another, when it comes to pain, we have a really tough time sharing with people, let alone God. You know, one of the best decisions I ever made was um, I went to counseling and I saw a therapist. Um, I didn't go like, yeah, I can't wait to go, but some people were like, hey, I think you should go. And I was like, why? But uh, <laughs> I went and I thought it was useless and pointless and I even told my therapist in his face, I think this is useless. Uh, but oh, how the turntables have turned. I went every week for two years. <laughs> and I remember sitting on the couch and I would talk about like my pain. Like, um, you know, one of the things that I really desire is um, my dad to be proud of me, you know? <sighs> Sorry, I'm crying so much. Um, <laughs> and as I shared these things, my therapist said, why don't you just say ouch? Just say the word ouch. And I realized as I began to say ouch how desperately I neglected the pain in my life. All these years, I realized how much I was suffering and I didn't even know. Whether it was because I was afraid to be weak, didn't believe anyone would care, having this belief to toughen up or the fact that pain hurt too much and it made me really feel uncomfortable, I had a hard time sharing my pain. You know, looking at verse 25, it says, we're going to look at, um, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into the side, I will never believe. If we could just humanize Thomas for a moment, Jesus showed up to his disciples before and Thomas wasn't there, I would be pissed, right? Like, if all your friends saw Jesus and you didn't, I would be mad. And at the same time, he had witnessed the death of a mentor, a teacher, and a friend. I would argue that Thomas is grieving and that he is in pain. Doubting was his way of sharing his pain in his heart. But I would even go a step further and say that doubting, by doubting, he was being courageous. You know, there's a quote by Brene Brown, um, if you don't know who she is, She's on Netflix, so definitely go watch it. Um, she's a researcher, social worker, storyteller who has done extensive research on vulnerability and shame. And she says, courage is a heart word. The root word for courage is core, the Latin word for heart. If one of its earliest forms, the word courage meant to speak one's mind by telling all one's heart. Over time, the definition has changed and today, we typically associate courage with heroic and brave deeds, but in my opinion, this definition fails to recognize the inner strength and level of commitment required for us to actually speak honestly and openly about who we are and our experiences, good and bad. Speaking from our hearts is what I think of as ordinary courage. So church, my first question, what, can we share our pain? 
What is your pain today? What is the pain that you may have numbed, pushed away, or not shared? Can we be like Thomas? Have the courage to acknowledge and share our pain. Can we say, ouch? Can we be authentic with God instead of trying to be perfect? You know, when we search our hearts and identify the pain in our hearts, um, I think this passage tells us something very interesting that happens when we do search our hearts. And so, uh, verse 26, it says eight, day, eight days later. Just a quick note, it may take some time for us to heal from our pain, just like it took Jesus eight days to come to Thomas again. It doesn't mean that he's not with us. It just takes time. Uh, so it reads, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, and I want to focus on that, the doors are locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Tom, I find it very interesting that Thomas asked Jesus to come meet him, but he does something to be, prevent the very thing that he asked Jesus to do by locking the door. Locking the door was a choice. And so a couple months ago, um, uh, so my question is this, what doors have you locked? A couple of months ago, I was working uh, when my retail store was closed, so I was working at HQ uh, on a project, and it required me to go to our, our storage basement and grab some supplies. So I went one day, and I usually leave the door open, uh, but today I was like, you know what, I'm going to listen to some music and close the door and just spend some time alone. After I was done, I went to open the door, and it wouldn't open. I thought it was a joke, but after a couple of tries, I realized I was locked in a basement for like a good 15 minutes. And what they forgot to tell me when they trained me was that the only way you could open the door was from the outside, but not the inside. And I said, who makes a door that way? Like, <laughs> and the answer is we do. You know, like when we come to church or just in general in life, if we're hurting, we put on a show of, of perfectionism. That's our door sometimes. And we so badly want to be seen, but we, we hide it and we lock it. And whether it's out of fear, pride, bitterness, anxiety, just like Thomas and the disciples, we create walls. You know, for example, uh, what prevents us from starting the healing process of our pain is not that God can't heal but it's us holding on to our pain and telling ourselves we're okay. Or what prevents us from being forgiving and feeling forgiven is not the gospel truth. It's us telling ourselves we messed up way too bad. You know, at my old church, we did a homeless outreach to Thompson Square Park in the city. It was winter time. We gave out coats, gloves, some coffee, and we would just kind of share the gospel with them. And it was really interesting. Like this one guy, I tried to approach him, you know, like share the gospel. And he was like, I don't sin. And I was like, well, all right. Well, the next person, here we go. Um, yeah, it was really weird. I didn't know what to do. But there was this another guy who shared his story with us. And uh, he told us how he was a drug dealer. And he told us all these crazy stories. And weirdly enough, I don't remember the stories. But what I do remember is the fact that he decided to be homeless because he felt like he deserved to. He said, this is my way of I can finally forgive myself by punishing myself. He locked any, uh, any door in on him being forgiven. What is your locked door? There are two things that I wish I could have told him that I would like to tell you today. And the first is Jesus is greater than any locked door that you have. Today, you may feel like the locked door has a hold on you and you can't open it or let it go. But if we read this passage, Jesus came and stood among them. Your locked door means nothing. Um, <laughs> two, 
Jesus doesn't condemn the disciples for locking the door, but he offers them peace. May we not feel guilty that we are struggling. May we not be so hard on ourselves that we aren't getting things right. And he says, peace be with you. Whatever you're protecting, whatever you're holding on to, God says, I have peace for that. And not only does he bring peace, but he meets us in a profound way. And we, and you know, like, um, I was rehearsing this, my sermon in my car yesterday I was as I was waiting to get a haircut. And, um, and I'm about to share the last part of my sermon. And, and the way Jesus meets Thomas, I rehearsed it and I kept on crying and I just couldn't finish it. And so uh, hopefully today I could finish it. Um, verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And the third question is, can we believe? As a church, as, a, as, as just a human being, can we believe? Um, a couple of months ago, my wife and I got into a disagreement. It happens all the time, but... Um, we had some people over and we bought a platter of meat and cheese. After everyone left, we had some lev leftovers and I was tired. So I put the meat and cheese together in one Tupperware. My wife, however, wanted the meat and cheese separate. And I could have separated the cheese, but I was being prideful, prideful and didn't want to seem wrong. So I created a big scene out of it. And we started fighting. I was like, no, you're wrong. And then she's like, no, you're wrong. And I was like, no, meat and cheese can be stored together. Because come to think of it, my ability to decide whether the cheese and meat should go together or shouldn't means that my ability to think and make a decision as a husband came into question. So I escalate this fight to the next level and we Google who is right. Um, <laughs> So I Google, can meat and cheese be stored together? And this is what I get. My husband is constantly <laughs> storing open blocks of cheese in the same container as his summer sausage, also opened. He insists that they don't need to be separated and that I'm being paranoid. I say he needs to dump hitch bachelor habits before we all get sick. Who is right? And after reading all the answers and me trying to still force that I'm right, I'll share you one answer that we got from Shiny Spoon God. Just, just, just to let you know, I do not believe in a spoon God. Um, I do not submit to the authority of a spoon God. I submit to the authority of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen? Amen. Come on. And he goes... I agree with Bob yet again. In fact, the cheese will probably go bad long before the sausage does. If either one lasts that long, which if your husband is like me, won't happen. What few organisms survive any sensible carrying process are quite likely beneficial strains that improve the quality of the final product, some strains of lactobacillus. This is all assuming sensible practices like washing hands. At the end, I don't even know who's right. Um, <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, um, the reason I share this story is because when me and my wife fight, like the, the door that I automatically lock on myself is um, we're the only ones fighting like this, you know? And to open up this Google and to actually see another couple fighting about the same thing, it made me feel like I was seen. You know, how much greater 
is the story of Jesus meeting Thomas in his people. You know, God sees us from heaven. He sees you and me. And he sees us in pain. And he sees us in suffering. And says, I do not want my children and the people I created to be alone in their pain and their suffering. So he sends his one and only son, Jesus Christ, in a form of a man to live on earth, to feel everything we felt, to weep, to cry, to laugh to be angry and to suffer and he goes and dies on the cross is broken has physical wounds and resurrection still showing those wounds and his brokenness and jesus says to us put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side do not disbelieve but believe jesus is saying i know what it's like to be in pain. I know what it's like to be in the darkest of emotions and the most painful realities. So would you just come to me? Would you just reach out for me and I can show you how I understand your pain. I have wounds too, just like you do. Not only that, the beautiful thing is that these wounds, the, the wounds that he shows us are healed. That means that healing is possible. That means that we don't have to stay in our wounds. So my question, again, can we believe, church? Can we believe? Church, um, my prayer is that we would be a church that would share our pain with God and with other people. You know, and, and, and as we go out into the world, there are hurting people all around us. And if we could just understand how God meets us in our pain, we can meet them in their pain. And I believe that's the gospel. And I believe that's the job of the church. At this time, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And we're just going to go into a time of reflection and prayer. You know, I think the, another beautiful detail of this passage is that Jesus meets Thomas when he was with people, when we, he was with the other disciples. And that's the beauty of us meeting right now. You know, when two or three or more are gathered, you know, Jesus is here. You know, and so um, can we just go into him in prayer? You know, can we just take a moment to just open our hands? You know, I'll go through the